So welcome to uh, this episode of the Our Coffee Lifestyle Podcast. My name's Sarah Connolly, and today I'm welcoming Dolce Gooman. Dolce is a client of Alcohol Free Lifestyle who just hit her one year alcohol free anniversary. Congratulations, Dolce. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, Coach Sarah. <laughs> so Dolce is uh, 43 years old. She's a lawyer, attorney, criminal defense, family law and immigration. And Dolce owns three law practices. She's also a mother of three little kids, the youngest being five, I think. Almost um, five. Almost, almost five. Um, she's married. She lives in Elk Grove, California. And like everything in life, Dolce is a high achiever. I know Dolce quite well. And just looking at her from the outside, looking in with all of these things that she has going on in her life, she's also committed herself to removing alcohol long term. So in this podcast today, we're going to explore with Dolce where she came from and the transition, the changes, the learnings that have got to her, to her place that she is today which is just over 12 months alcohol free. So welcome Dolce and thank you so much for joining us. My first question for you is every person has a moment where they say enough is enough when it comes to their drinking and their decision to quit. So I'm interested if you would share with our listeners today, what was your point of no return? How did it look for you? What was going on? Yes, thank thank you, Sarah. I, a pleasure to be here. My honor to be here. Um, well, look, I didn't start drinking until the legal age of 21. Um, before that, I had alcohol in my life, not by me actually consuming it, but just in my life. And so I had a different perspective on things. But when I first took that first drink, I just, I think I realized what my, and this is, I'm, I'm trying to give it a short answer, but I realized what it did for people and in particular did for my father in in relieving some stress and other things but um i think let's just to answer enough was enough it took me till 42 but i had a lot of periods where i tried to um quit or stop it for some time or get control of it uh for even in my 20s even in my 30s even and then early 40s but i think the enough was enough was when I got angry with myself because I felt like I had so much control and everything else but that and it just was holding me back from a lot of things so yeah and and those previous attempts because most people will share that on their journey they don't just quit with the first go do you what do you think was different about this time that made it stick was it the mindset going into it? Were you really de more determined, do you think? Well, in your 20s, I just think you're just a kid still. I uh, think what you think is, and you're also influenced by who's around you, what they're doing. But internally, I just knew it was wrong. I knew what it had done to me, uh, like it being in my life, not me consuming it. Um, I just felt the guilt and shame from it in the early 20s, which is which is pretty crazy when I think about it, but then I just kept doing it. And I had a lot of reasons why I think I did, but um, I think fast forwarding to 42, when I actually made the decision, decision was, well, yeah, my marriage is going down the drain. My uh, kids, I, they can't go through what I did. And I think the biggest change for me was I wanted it so bad for myself. And I think that's the difference. Before I wanted it for somebody else, people look to look at me in a different light. But now, now I can still say I wanted it so bad for myself. Yeah. And, and that feeling disappointed and angry with yourself was really the catalyst in the end for you to say, right, I've got to actually do something here. Yeah, I mean, I did the podcast with James at 90 days and he he called me on my uh, year and he said, you're so far from that zombie that you were at uh, the right before you joined. And when he means that, what he means is that I had, uh, I would say I would had told him that um, when I decided to join, it was two days prior, but I was so fucked up off of alcohol, lack of words right here that and I was so lost and I was just so disappointed with myself, you know, and the shame of I started up again, might as well just keep it going. And I was in a parking lot and I just knew I was scared, but somehow I got a message out to my husband um, 
or maybe it was the friend that was with me that I needed somebody to pick me up. The scariest part about it was somehow I reached from one parking lot to the other, but the complete blackout is what scared me. And the fact that that's just not me. I just, that's just not me. So it was just like upsetting that I actually have gotten back to that point where it was so severe, I needed to do something about it. And I told my husband the next day, I was like, if it's not rehab, I got to find something. And he was agreeable, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And so you went online, I believe you went online, did a search, found alcohol free lifestyle, made the commitment. Can you recall how you felt straight after making that commitment that you were going to quit? Um, I knew I was committed. I'm just that type of person when I sign up for something. I, I didn't care what the cost was. I just knew I needed to make an investment on myself and make it quickly before things can turn really bad for myself and my family. So um, I know I, I spoke to one of um, a team member from AFL and he actually said, you are not too off of the type of people we have in this program. And I come, the thing is, I feel like even though you say high achiever and I, I, I don't like even taking that title, I like to say that I came from nothing and I built myself up, but then there's always something holding me back from my highest potential. So when I made that call, I didn't care what he said. I just said, if it's not in, in rehab, I actually reached out to, but uh, I got no calls back and I got an immediate call back from AFL and they set up the time and and I was committed and they knew I was. So that's when I joined. Did you feel relieved? Definitely. hundred percent. I did feel, um, I don't know, even with signing up, I think I felt a little shame about it because I knew that, that, you know, um, me sitting where I am today in career wise to, to say I have this big issue that's just holding me down, but it felt definitely felt like relief because somebody was listening. Yeah. Yeah. And so the shame that many of us feel prior to making the decision can really hold us back from actually moving forward because we don't want to say I have a problem or anything like that. But you did that. Tell me what happened to the shame when you joined the program and started to meet other people who perhaps you related to that were also struggling. Well, Def, I mean, in the first 90 days, it's it, it's it's really hard to share your feelings. But when I shared a couple of things and I noticed like people were really attentive and they're really caring and um, just listening. And um, I got nods and I got a little reassurance that, you know, you're not the only one. I realized we're all on this wavelength and we're all on the same wavelength together. Um, and honestly, I mean, I could say it, fast forward to now. I've never, ever been able to share with anybody, including my husband, um, the way I felt internally, the way I've been able to share with the, the group of people I've met through this program. And how do you In, think... Sorry, including coaches. <laughs> <laughs> how do you think that changed your experience? Because that shame and being unable to talk about this problem can be really deep ingrained in people and can really hold them back from finding the freedom so for you where is that at now and how did that evolve and change all right let me try to break that down well i would say back when i was joining in the first few weeks like i knew I'm the type of person that if I'm going to sign up for something, I'm going to be all in. So my whole thing was, they said two meet two meetings a week requirements. I'm like, I'll do four or five, whatever it is. So I did probably an average of four. Um, these polos, that was a little resistance there. And that's like, and I, and I had to explain this in the Project 90 call uh, with James was, you know, it's where all of us that are in this program can just let out our feelings um, and be able to not have any judgments. I think the the biggest thing is like, I grew up with, you don't talk about a lot of things. You just keep, keep it down and keep it secret. And even when you weren't doing anything wrong, you're just supposed to be so private and just being able to release that was just in itself uh, liberating. So, mm -hmm. 
and I'm and sorry, I don't know if I got this half of your question. No, 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 that's that's absolutely great. So you've come in, you've met some like minded people, you've been able to release the pressure valve of shame and pushing it down and keeping um, a lid on all of these feelings. You did 90 days, then you committed to another six months. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Can you recall? Go, Go ahead. Sorry. At ninety days, what? Where were you at at ninety days that made you think, you know, what? I'm going to keep going here. I'm going to keep on this path. Well, at the ninety day, in the ninety days, I had a lot of life come up, um, and of course, in your ninety days, if anyone's going to take advice from me, you just focus on just keeping that alcohol you know, away. I don't care if you have to not go to places and stuff like that. People have this, oh, you can't avoid these things. The 90 days are crucial to just starting the process. But I had um, I had a uh, friend, and I'll just say her name, Amy in the program. And she was just like, girl, after the 90 days is when it hits. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I certainly realized it's the reality because we just haven't dealt with these feelings without masking them or filtering them or using any substance. And I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. To me, the 90 days was a little bit like you're in a goal setting. You're just trying to reach this limit. And then um, once you get there, you know, and I'm sure these people in Project 90 think this, that's it. We've made it. We made the 90 days. No, 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 no. The work, real work lies within beyond that. Um, and when I signed up, I signed up for a year. So I, I knew I was going to continue on. Um, but as far as the drinking, I knew that I just felt the, the biggest reason I joined too, besides feeling like a zombie and not remembering the night before the anxiety would kill me at like 3am. And so I had a lot of anxiety no one knew it was just so internal and it was just this burning thing that just kept boiling over and I thought actually at one point that it was going to kill me I was going to get what is that called a panic attack at a certain point because I had panic attacks I actually had to I wanted to reach over to my husband but then I was like I don't want him to say I told you so so there was a little of that going on before I joined but I think he knew it was just like he's a deep sleeper I just sleep very lightly already. So anything that is going to ruin that and, and alcohol was um, and the guilt and shame with waking up with going, ah, shit, I did it again, or damn it, here we go again. And just not being present made me say, okay, that was part of the joining. And then that continuing the 90 days, I slept like a baby after a week. Mm -hmm. And I was just shocked that it, it just needed to be the removing of the alcohol. So yeah, I think it's um, something that people do find surprising because people often use alcohol to sleep. Right. I've heard that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I have siblings that say, how did you sleep after that? I'm like, what are you talking about? I slept like a baby. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's that. And then the continuing on, I just, it, things just kept getting better and better, whether it be business, whether it be my relationships. Um just uh, feeling like I belong to something now. And I think a part of that was this um, group. I always felt like an outcast. Um, my parents, I'm, I, I'm born in India. I, I came from Punjab when I was one. My parents cho chose to live in the most racist town in the world, I would say. And we just, there was bullying, all kinds of crap going on when I grew up. And it's like, dude, you guys chose this place. So I always felt a little bit like I want to be like that person, but never voiced it and just kind of like held it internal. And I think later on in life, when I chose to drink, it kind of relieved that stuff. And it does. I mean, alcohol does relieve it. But again, what, what are we talking about? Talking temporarily, we're talking artificial. I didn't realize till 40s that that's what that was. So yeah. yeah. So Tell me about anxiety now, because anxiety is um, horrific if you experience it. I also have experienced it in my life. Does it still have a role in your life or tell me what's happened with the anxiety? It definitely still has a role. Um, definitely. If, if I can give it a range where it was, if we're going through one to 10, I was above the like beyond 10 when I was drinking. I'll say I have my moments, um, like two or three, and it's usually worry about my children, worry about some project or deadline, but it's very brief. 
and it, and it lasts so short and then it's just like breathe and really is it going to change if I do this or is it going to change if I do this no so it's kind of like I think about my uh, reaction I kind of break it down like yes it's always going to be there but it's certainly way lower than what I had going and you know I'm a year into this I just think that it could get it's only going to get better where it lessens so yeah. and and do you think looking back that when you felt anxiety, your reaction, as opposed to the response was to drink to try and release the anxiety? 100%. I mean, I chose, I probably shouldn't have chose law, given like what I've been through as a child that I chose law, but I actually wanted to be a police officer because like I used to think police officers were like, my savior when I was younger, and I want to be like those badass cops, you know, doing this thing. Now I cross examine them. So totally opposite end of things. But right. um, with law, you deal with especially family law. And, and the, the beauty of what I've gone through this program is I could, I'm at a level now where I can choose what kind of cases and choose what area to just, and I'm slowly so getting out of family law. And I'm not saying that there's, there has to be somebody to do that job, but you also got to, I can make the choice to say, all right, there's someone else out there to do this, not me anymore. You know, it's, it just too hits too close to home, especially when children are involved and, uh, people bickering and fighting that just, and, and a lot of that did, I mean, I only start, I've only been practicing for about seven years. I went into law later on. I was a paralegal before that, but getting into law and seeing the, you know, what people fight over and it just, it's so exhausting and you just want to go, you wanted to go get a drink afterwards. Now I just look at it as like, I'm not going to even put it on my plate right now. I don't have to. I don't need to. Yes, I mean, legal problem. People come to you with a legal problem, so it's going to be a problem. But it's so more manageable. I'm able to speak to them in a more calmer. Uh, in my my, I would say I have always had good advice. I would just say it's a little bit more where it's like, is this going to make a difference? No. Is this going to make a difference? Yes. So I'm at a more, um, even better logical state than I was before. So. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like there's you're a lot more measured, not just with your clients, but also with yourself. Like when anxiety comes up, you're able to have that conversation of what's going to make a difference. Yes, you... uh, definitely. As uh, so, I always laugh. My friend and and uh, when I did the podcast with James and at ninety days. I was with a certain person and I was like, well, I won't say who that was. And it's the same guy now. And actually he's quit drinking for a bit um, while well, he did. And he just had a little crash here after 90 days. Um, Cause I told him, I was like, you have to join some kind of community. You're just going to give up at the end. And um, well, he had a good taste of the joy of missing out, but I think he's like now upset with himself. Like, Oh shoot, I broke it, whatever. Well, he, he said to me, um, shoot, what were we talking about before that? Uh, we were talking about managing and being measured about. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's like, in the beginning, even when you're, even when you stop drinking, you're just, you still have some of those patterns, right? You're just automatic like response. And he's like, Ooh, that lawyer is mad at you. And he, and I was like, I know I'm going to write this nasty email back. And he goes, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. You, you so seem so calm about everything else. Why don't you wait it out? My newest thing is, wait it out or don't even respond just be sun Tzu. and life has just been so much easier just being sun Tzu. it's like these people are angry because they're not getting their point across and it's funny to say this in law because a lot of it's arguing right but sometimes less is more and and it's i always knew that it's just now i can actually practice it so yeah so i totally get what you're saying because i think when you're drinking you're so fueled you're fueled by anxiety, you're fueled by um, the desire to make stuff different to what it actually is. And that comes across in everything, comes yeah. across in how we react to life. So it sounds to me like you've got very proficient at creating a pause between something that triggers you and how you respond, which is one of the most beautiful things that happens for people once they remove alcohol. So you've talked about anxiety and um, then you kind of talked a little bit about business. Tell me, um, how has your experience with your work shifted from where you were to where you are now 12 months on? 
Well, um, I did nothing in the first 90 days to like advertise, market, tell people, hey, I'm trying out this new area. I just had so many people just start approaching me. And I think it's the energy, especially I think it started at 60 days is when I actually got like a call. Hey, we seen you in court. Um, and this was in the uh, uh, Southern California area. Uh, we want to talk business, you know, and and I'm still with that uh, firm mm -hmm. today. It's 800, um, 800 new clients in the first 90 days. And um, James knows that. Um, and that was, you know, that's in the immigration area. Um, since then, you know, I never thought like, because they always say, oh, you, you uh, practice in California, so you can only do California. But when you go to immigration and that, that area, I've been able to, and the best part is, is I love traveling. So I'm able to use business to travel. But um, as you know, I, I traveled to Australia and um, that happened at like the six month level where I got a call maybe a little after six months. Um, hey, uh, we know you do this area and we had heard about your work. And it's just like, you just, you're just doing what you're doing and you're continuing to do it. And if people are approaching you without even batting an eye and it's, uh, it's exploded. And in fact, uh, I just got a call. I had, I woke up last night at 1230 AM, um, my time to do a call in Australia, Adelaide, Adelaide, so Adelaide, yeah. Adelaide sorry. And, uh, you know, it's from the Brisbane, um, uh, colleague or agent I have, and it's talking about business immigration. So, uh, we're, we're about to explode there, but I, I never would have said, Oh, I'm going to get up at 1230 to do a call and, you know, this and that. And I got up, still was able to get up at 430 AM to do my gym session. So nothing is stopping me now. So that's the best part about it. And I'm not, um, trying so hard either. I think I was trying a so much harder when I was drinking because I was trying to make up for what I didn't do or what I think I didn't do or what my family thinks I didn't do. There's just so much in your mind when you're drinking and it just exasperates or uh, what's the word? Exacerbates. Something like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> makes it worse. It makes it worse. Yeah. <laughs> that big term. Okay. So. We'll go with that. Yeah. Wow. That's extraordinary. And so anxieties reduced business has exploded you're calmer you're more centered you're more focused you're less um attached and graspy which is how i think we can be we're kind of chasing after things when we're not present it sounds like you're a lot more present tell me about relationships um family kids husband how's that going i'll start with my kids and and um I think my kids are, ooh, uh, if I wasn't going to do it for myself, I had always had wanted to do it for my children. I think the change actually, and we had that question earlier is you, it's never, you have to want it for yourself to, to for the long run. I don't think with my kid, just saying it's for my kids, but actually want the want. And, and, and that was for me for sure. And my, obviously everything else, after that so kids is next I told husband you're always going to take the third seat on that and um he's a kid himself so as I joked in my last podcast I feel like I have a fourth kid sometimes but uh everything is just way more lighter beautiful I mean if our fights are over anything sometimes I'm like why are we fighting over this and I and I'm so non-responsive on that and then afterwards I come back and go oh I'm sorry I think I I said too much it was about clutter or something like that I'm like mm, okay get over it Clutter is going to be I have three practices and three kids. So no doubt. Yeah. Part of life. Part of life. So definitely that I'm more present. And I see my older daughter had so much anxiety. And I think it started when my dad passed away in 2017. She just didn't know what death was. And she saw how like the family reacted and how everybody was just in their own thing. And she was young. I think she's in first grade or second grade. I started getting calls where they were like, okay, uh, she's freaking out. Can you come pick her up? She says, my mom's never going to come back, come back. And I think she just had this thing like, you know, death, that means, you know, and she knew probably lightweight, like my mom drinks or whatever. She never said it, never has even still to this day, which is kind of crazy. She just said, I did ask her. She does recently, we can get into that later, but she says, uh, or she doesn't even say anything. I could just feel that anxiety drop 
significantly in her where she's not calling to check where I'm at every five seconds. She's not rushing out when I'm going to go put the garbage out. Like, where did you go? And she, she did that quite often. Now she's 14. My middle daughter kind of has always been like following her, like copying whatever she's doing. She seems to be a little bit more like, yeah, this is life. Right. And so she has her own personality. She's a Gemini. I say they all have their own personalities. And uh, the little guy, he's just, He's just loving his life right now because he's got his sober mom, right? So I'm like, whatever you want to do, let's go. And I always wanted a boy and he came. And so me and him have lots, lots of fun. So children, and they're getting to travel with me. I take them on the business trips. Uh, I'm going to Hawaii next, which isn't a business trip, but I can make it a business trip if I really wanted it to. <laughs> <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> so sorry. Amazing. Husband, husband. Yeah, I think he just... The only thing I dislike about husband in this situation is he, I felt like before it was like, yeah, the drinking was there. He knew that like something goes wrong is just because of your drinking, but I was handling everything so much, even though I was drinking. And that's the thing is uh, with him and I, we've had this thing where it's like, he said, no, I, I really say that you're harming. Like he had a friend that passed away from alcoholism. He had like he sees it he just doesn't see what's going on internally because like I call him the unicorn he doesn't he doesn't know why people need it or why people were using it so he has this really different perspective on alcohol you quit when you want to quit you should have the willpower you know all that stuff but he didn't understand the deeper work I think as time's gone on and me not having to say much and he's actually drinking less too I've seen him drink a lot less than he has been but I never found it to be like a huge issue for him where it was the way it was for me. So I respect that. And I, and I see it and I, and I like that he, even though he doesn't acknowledge that I haven't drank in a year that he's actually like so much calmer himself, like not worried about where I went, what I did, got the kids, that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of what you're sharing is the concept of the show don't tell. So, you know, often when we, quit alcohol people feel the need to perhaps talk about it all the time and tell people and make a big deal but actually it sounds to me like what you've done is you've just been the change in your actions as opposed to going and enforcing it on other people it's just that show that you're changing don't tell and it kind of happens naturally through osmosis Oh, trust me. I wanted to tell. I wanted to be like, I, I have know. not drank in this long and you have not noticed. But I asked advice to some of my fellow uh, Project 90 and Beyond 90 friends. And they're like, just keep your mouth shut. I was like, that's a good idea. So we'll just do that. And then some coaches too. So the thing is, is um, I like that I can, I normally I used to be like, all right, no, I'm going to say something. But the fact that I took the clear mind and clarity to say, okay, does it make sense for me to say something or why isn't he acknowledging it? Who cares? You're just doing this for you now. So yeah. that part yeah. is nice. Absolutely. The need not to chase after validation. Exactly. Mm, very good. Um, so the last thing I want to touch on uh, is you talked about belonging and community. Tell me, how big a role that played in your life getting you to where you are now well i as a child i think i felt like i had to grow up very quickly because i had to handle stuff that a child should not i had a lot of resentment where i was really good at soccer i had a scholarship at all these things and but then i always just felt so alone um no one was listening my parents didn't give a fuck i mean my uh siblings they seem to be in their own world because they're dealing with their own um trauma and it's just like after time you just even in high school I, I think high school is where I really felt alone I remember I got the scholarship or before I got the scholarship they're like you are the five of the 15 people that are going to Germany to play soccer I was in a German class and we won the world cup or whatever and as five girls are going these 10 guys are going and I was like oh shit my concern wasn't like, I wasn't even excited. I was like, are my parents going to be able to let me go? Are they going to be able to afford it? Cause they had, I came from nothing. So the biggest thing was I always just felt like I don't want to share it. And that made me feel alone. I felt like I shared it with my 
professor because I was like, do I need a visa for this? And I had an Indian passport at that time. And she's like, no, you shouldn't. And I, and I did need a visa. So I found out when I got to Germany, that's a whole nother story. But um, the people I was around, they were just so popular. They had came from money and um, the stature that I, I just didn't have. And I um, was embarrassed to admit a lot of it. But my my way of was it I can show it look like I could play really good. I do these things well. And, um, you know, alcohol really just helped me feel better in my 20s. So much so that it made me say, okay, I'm not alone, which is scary is that you're relying on a substance to go, oh, you're not alone. And it really is just a substance. It really is this poison just sitting beside you. And it works. It works. That's the scary part. It works for a lot. I mean, I, if I wanted to be brave, I can drink. If I wanted to be the best for speaker, I even used it to play sports sometimes when I, not in my uh, teenage years, but in my 21 over, I was going to the gym before I drank, or I drank and then went to the gym. And now I think back, how stupid was that? But a lot of uh, things that were, I used it before um, doing a big public speaking event, just social events. And then the biggest thing is I used it for the most was like, I'm not going to be like my father who isolated himself and drank in the garage and avoided us and abandoned. But the whole time I thought, I'm not, uh, when I drink, I thought I was with somebody and I was really abandoning myself the whole time. And I didn't, it took me till 40 something to realize that, but, um, the alone part, um, joining this, uh, program and being able to share some of the things that other people might like look at you sideways. Cause I know a couple of people got wind of my life story and they kind of gave me a different look or they just avoided me. And perhaps, I sh you know, now I look at it as they were just scared. They don't know how to help or whatever the situation is. And now we're dealing with, I put myself in the spot. I, I am a high achiever, if I really want to say it out loud. Um, no, no one else has three practices in my family. No one else has a, a business going well for them. No one else has a family that's still a unit. I mean, my older sister does, but she's got other stuff going on. And it's just like, uh, I'm not alone. And I could actually speak to others about it. And they're just like, well, wait a minute, you know, you you were never alone in your mind you were, but it's, it, it's a, it really is just your own internal, my, I call it a tug of war in my mind. Uh, that's always been going on. And I can still picture it now to this day. I have strong men on one side tugging war and that's the alcohol side, strong, like muscular. I have skinny men, well, I'll say men and women on the other side, tugging on the other end. Now it's changed after a year where the strong side is, they're strong, but they're hungover and they're sick and they're like these jockeys are like, oh, we fucked up last night. The other ones are skinny, fit and smart. And it's it's just one over. I, I don't know. It's just my mental, uh, after a year, that's what I get. And the tug of war is pretty much over uh, in the sense that I know the alcohol is sitting there where those, those jockey men are sitting, but it's just so far on the other side where it would take a real big tug to pull me back to the other side, so. Yeah. I love that visual. Now, I think a lot of people will relate to that, that inner battle that we have, but that you've yeah. now got a really powerful visual for that. So wonderful. Um, tell me, so before I, I'm going to ask you for your top tips for our listeners in just a moment, but well, before I do, I wonder if you could share what your relationship is like with yourself now from being so angry and disappointed and shameful, how do you feel about yourself now, a year on? Honestly, even though it's a year on, I think um, I think it's still a lot of work after a year. Like, I didn't even recognize, like, the difference of who I was and am and potentially going to be. I think that I just each day I learned to love myself a little bit more. It's really hard. I'll say that. That's probably the hardest thing in this journey is just like, it's okay. This I literally have to talk to myself like a baby. I mean, like that, that other person's the baby. I'm the adult going, it's okay. <laughs> Come on over. It's going to be all right. And um, a lot of it's just because I was just so shut down and uh, tried other things. And it just, that sense of belonging wasn't there. And now it's just like, what are you so afraid of? Like, all this has been good. Everything's been energy and uh, business and your family and everybody's just looking at you. I mean, I feel like I was always looked at 
for help. But now I'm really looked at as a role model, not just help, but it's like, okay, I want to do that. I want to try that. So um, I'm trying to, as Sam Smith song, love yourself a little bit more. Was it love yeah. me more? <laughs> yeah. And I think that. it takes, I think it's going to keep taking work though. That's the thing. I don't think that ever is going to um, be an end result. Like you just, I think that it's uh, going to, I think it's going to get better over time, but it's always going to be a work in progress, progress. Sorry. Yeah. But you know, what I love about that is the difference between the work in progress now isn't quitting alcohol. It's in cultivating more self-love. And um, that's a key distinction that I think is so powerful because the focus is on gaining something more beautiful and nourishing and nurturing as opposed to trying to run away from something dark and something debilitating. It's beautiful. I agree. I agree. I mean, I, I was reading back on my uh, six months, what I wrote. I was like, oh, my God, what did I write? But and then my letter to alcohol, which was a couple of projects we got uh, through this program through you coaches. Um, I mean, the value we used to place on alcohol and it just the thing is, and that's the thing is, if we're going to go into tips, I'll wait for that. Actually, we'll go ahead. <laughs> well, let's go straight into it. So um, imagining the, the reality is there are people listening to this who are perhaps before even making a decision to quit and just considering it and perhaps they're in pain perhaps they're confused we've already got a few people listening that are maybe a bit further down the path so what would your tips be firstly for our first group people that are listening that are just in pain and struggling I love that you break it down like that because that's how I break it down in my head it's stages I mean just like life is so is the journey and um Look, in the first 90 days, there's so many times you want to give up. You're going to feel like you're a one-man army. It's lonely. Even if you have the group, it just feels so lonely. You have everybody around you going, oh, you, you can't just have one. It's not a celebration, especially the field I work in. Uh, it's like you lose, you drink. You win, you drink. You know, that's their that's their thing. Is The thing is, though, you have to want it so bad for yourself. That's the only way. And in those 90 days, think... If you, if you can give it those 90 days for yourself, you will, uh, your ROI will be exponential. It'll be beyond. And when I say ROI, you return on your investment, you, your, your, uh, gains are going to be way far beyond than you can even imagine. So don't think about the, in the 90 days, don't think about when's 90 day going to come up, just take it day by day. You know, I know if everybody's heard that before, but again, giving up is so much easier right and uh, no one's ever gained anything from giving up right so why why give up and if you've come this far to join the program and called up afl or whoever it is you definitely have come to a point where you want to make a change and you know you've tried probably a hundred times before but you're still wanting to help that inner self and i always tie it i think drinking especially when it's a problem for somebody there's a underlining emotion or emotions and a lot of people will say no no it's just because you know I got addicted to it you know over time I just got used to having it for stress no there's some underlining stuff it doesn't you're not going to know that in the 90 days focus on the 90 days of not giving up and if you start to feel lonely lean in and stop isolating yourself so definitely lean in um the more you do, it will kind of ease up things. And it's fleeting. I just feel like it, it lasts for a bit and then it'll be like, okay, oh yeah, that wasn't so bad. But it would have been so much worse if you just easily gave up. And you're not, no one in this program that's joined, I don't, do not believe is it, you say they're high achievers. I do not believe they're the type of people that give up. So um, they're definitely here for a reason for the long run. So that's the first 90 days. After that, just get ready and buckle up and uh, look how to feel. <laughs> learn how to deal with your emotions um, without using substance and don't worry about that uncover those emotions it kind of feels beautiful to uncover those emotions because you're just like wait a minute I never knew I felt this way about myself or I never knew well I knew this shit happened to me but I never knew that I actually had been drinking to uh, protect myself from avoid those feelings or escape those feelings and a lot of us tend to go ah 
yeah, we've been through this shit, so we deserve to have a drink or we deserve to cover it up or, well, you, it, how, how long is that going to last? It's very artificial. It's very temporary. And so in the next six months, focus on the beauty of uncovering that. I used to have, I felt like even when I drank, I just have appreciation for ex- beauty and excellence and um, love and all these things. And it would just, I was like, oh, this is so euphoric with the drinking and made it even uh, more beautiful. But I laugh at that now because I'm just like, well, and then when the alcohol dies off, then you're just like, eh, where the hell am I? What am I doing? And so it does, it heightens everything. But just l- living at that, uh, there's a word you use, I think. Um, Homeostasis. There's another word you use with an E, I think. It's a yoga yoga term. Oh, equanimity. There you go. I'm not going to be able to <laughs> say it, so I'll let you say it. <laughs> living at that state in the six months has been beautiful. And, and wanting to continue to be at that um, in every situation because you'll not expect beauty coming at you and you're like, oh my goodness. And I'm really feeling it to be awake for it. So that's, I don't know. It's a long answer to your question. No, but I, I love that you used the word awake because when you talk about where you were, you, you or James used the word zombie, which is like, the opposite of, of being awake and now you're awake and with that awakeness comes beauty presence joy passion freedom in full color as opposed to like you talked about the fake artificial yeah illusion it's an illusion that we're getting these things when we're drinking what an extraordinary transformation in just 12 months so last I'm looking, forward to the, looking forward to the next 12 months see what happens so this is my next question okay what's, what's uh what's the goal for you moving forward in regards to alcohol with alcohol there's no question in my mind that it's just not part of my life there's no value to it um and i continue to want to grow because i have that thirst for life that i didn't have before Mm-hmm. And I would say each day I'm like, okay, what? And I, and I'll, I know this about myself, which is great too. You'll start learning stuff about yourself. Like I can't get bored. I'm, I don't like dull moments, even with my law practice. I'll be like, all right, I got to get out of here and go walk around or something. Cause it's just too much in my office sometimes. And uh, being aware, awareness is your superpower. I agree hundred percent. And I know we heard that from our coaches many times. And then my thing is, Sometimes I'm just being now and things are coming to me, even things I don't expect, but I can't get bored. So everybody knows in this program that's been along with me at 90 days, I bought myself a drop top car (laughs) and I just love going, uh, you know, 160 plus uh, down the road with it, which is dangerous. That's fine. I love my thrill still, um, but they're real and I'm awake while I'm doing them. I just bought myself a vintage cafe racer motorcycle. Husband doesn't know yet. He will find out <laughs> soon. <Not> <laughs> and I, I, I tested that out a bit, but I was a little, cause it's, it's a old school bike. So it's a little bit where you have to work out the gear system. Um, he's going to find out soon. Yeah, you're right. Um, but either that, or if I die driving, like, you know, or riding a little fast, you know, who knows, but the point is I'll be done. I'll, I'll die awake. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going off to a tangent there. And um, I think the thing is, is like, the biggest transformation I've had is that I feel like I'm unstoppable. If I want to do something, I, there's no doubt in my mind before I used to have that, you know, no one knew that that doubt was there on the outside because I always be smiling, but now inside, I know there's no doubt. If I want to pick up and forget law today and go do another business, I feel like I just do fine. So that, and then my kids getting to um, experience life the way it, the way they should as a kid and I didn't is sorry get emotional a little bit on that um but I don't want to spoil them because that's uh you know that's how you learn right uh things don't come easy and they don't and they never will but if you're alcohol free they might come a little easier so well I just want to thank you for like 45 minutes of really powerful wisdom um and really just another story that is just so extraordinary from where you were to where you are now in just 12 months 
to, from zombie to unstoppable, <laughs> from somebody that was angry and disappointed in yourself to someone who's each day trying to love yourself a little bit more, the relationships that you're having, the success that you're having through just being instead of doing, um, is inspirational. So I really want to thank you for joining us today. I know that you've been super generous with your time and that there's a lot of other things you could be doing, like screeching down the highway in your, in your fast car. No, I mean, uh, I'll add to that. Uh, I, it, like I went, uh, we got like nine minutes. I'll add to that. So my, I do criminal defense, right? So I had a friend uh, who had a, case from back in the 1989 to 91 two, two friends sort of cousins and it was a you know a pedophile situation and so me being defense counsel and I do not do those cases I want to put that out in the public I mm -hmm. find them you know even if there's an innocent person in something like that I still just it's not something that I can manage to in my head to think it's okay to defend something like that even if the person's innocent I just I just wouldn't have that capacity to do it in my mind so anyway, um, friend over the years, she suffered so much from what happened to her when between the ages of eight and 11 and the other, her cousin, which, you know, I became friends with her too after that. And I went throughout the trial and I was present for them. Like be they would have not noticed the difference if I was drinking or not, because I've always tried to be present, but it wasn't, I internally, I felt like I was so much more present, um, the way I felt about being there for every moment. The jury just came back today, guilty on all 10 counts that that person is going away for a long time. And what they've suffered in their 40, they're in their 40s, early 40s now, testifying about what happened to them as kids. There's a long story about why they didn't, they've told and adults covering it up and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I watched that grown old 60 something year old man going away for the crimes he committed, um, you know, in his 20s. Uh, but justice was served. And I just felt so. Oh, my God, at peace of watching that, like, you know, I cried for them, but, you know, normally my reaction would have been like, yeah, fucker, you're going down, you know, or something like that. But it was I cried and I watched him just break down in court of you know, I have to actually deal with the reality of what I've done before. And we all will, um, you know, so anyway, on that uh, sad note, uh, uh, it, was just <laughs> nice being, it was nice being there and they couldn't be there themselves. These victims couldn't because I have one in Chicago, one friend, and the other one was out of the state. And the other one, frankly, she's just like, I don't want to be there because I'm worried that it's going to come back, um, you know, in favor of him. And then I don't know what I would do. And, um, you know, these two people, these two kids were traumatized by a two people, a grandfather and an uncle in family relations. But the fact that the grandfather died without justice being served enraged them to bring the case up. And that's in short. But the fact that justice was served on the one that's still living and the rest of his life is going to be, you know, dealing with the consequences and it was beautiful to witness it, even though, I mean, it's sad in all ends, but at the same time, it was beautiful to witness it for my friends. So. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, I mean, maybe they didn't notice the difference with your experience of that, but you certainly have. And oh, I certainly have. And it felt, it feels so much better to be awake for these kind of moments. And that's the thing. I think everybody in um, our society and culture especially ones that still oh we need to celebrate when we drink we need to celebrate when it's a sad moment you're not feeling that's the thing you're numbing and so you're really not feeling what the real feeling is and the real feeling can be a number of different things we have so many emotions in our body let them be and uh otherwise you're not living so well on that very powerful note thank you so much dolce for joining us and i cannot wait to see what's going to happen in the next 12 months. Thanks. Take care, Thank sir. You. Love you. Bye. Bye.